No, I don't. And I can't believe I couldn't see the real you until this moment. I'm sorry, but there is no way I would marry someone like you. Enraged, Michelle turned towards me and tried to kick my guide dog but slipped on her own dress and fell down the short flight of stairs that led up to the altar. So let me start off by saying that my name is Josh, and I haven't always had the easiest life. Thankfully, I was raised by some of the loveliest parents around. They have always been incredibly supportive. Even my brother Abe and I have an amazing relationship. The thing that has made my life challenging, though, was that I was in a terrible accident when I was younger. I was playing in an abandoned building when a canister of chemicals fell on me and damaged my eyes so much that I was left blind for the rest of my life. I have to admit that I found my new life terrifying, and I really didn't know how I could possibly live the rest of my life without my sight. It sent me into a deep depression, and it took me many years before I finally was able to dig my way out of all the self-pity and helplessness that I was feeling. Eventually, I did indeed find a way to live my life, and even found a way to actually be able to live my life to the fullest. To start with, I had to find something that I could do for a living, and Abe suggested that I start up a vlog. At first, it sounded silly, but I eventually came around to the idea and started one, and it has made all the difference in the world. I had never thought that people would want to watch me live my life, but that I could also make a career out of it. I use several apps to make it possible for me to interact with my audience. Apps that read out comments to me, as well as convert my speech to text for when I want to comment back. Plus, my parents and Abe all help me when I can't use such apps. You would be surprised how user-friendly technology has become to people like myself. As you might imagine, meeting people became quite difficult as well. But the more comfortable that I became with my disability, the more independent that I became. However, Abe didn't have that excuse. Abe was always a very charming and attractive man, but had bad luck when it came to picking women. He had a bad habit of dating women that were pretty but were awful people. He was such a good person and just couldn't see anything negative in other people. So when he called me up and told me that he had started dating someone, I was a bit skeptical. Hey bro, how's life? Pretty good. How about yourself? Great actually. I met an amazing woman that I know that you and our parents will love. Oh yeah, that's great. When do we get to meet her? Tonight actually. Considering his past relationships, I wasn't expecting much, but I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. As I was dropped off by a cab, I was finishing up a live stream from the day. I had taken my seeing eye dog to the park and was telling people all about the program where I got her. It was important to me to bring awareness to the wonderful program that I got her from. As I was nearing the end of the stream, I got into a cab that would take me to my parents' house. The driver informed me that he had pulled up in front of the sidewalk that led to the front porch, and I paid him and stepped out. As I was leaving the car, I placed my walking stick down and started walking the front door when my dog indicated that there was someone standing a few feet in front of me and that I should stop moving. I could hear her turn around and sigh heavily. Oh, whoa there. Can't you see where you're going? You almost hit me with that stick of yours. Um, unless my dog isn't doing her job right, I should be several feet away from you. Oh, oh, you're blind. That explains why you were heading to the wrong house. I had a bad feeling in my stomach. Something told me that this woman was Abe's new girlfriend, and we were already off to a bad start. I quickly told my audience that I would be ending the stream for the day and turned off my phone. Oh my god. Not only are you blind, but you're one of those so-called influencers too? Did you just say goodbye to the three people that follow you? It's no wonder that someone as poor as you would be trying to get sympathy from people in such a rich neighborhood as this. I actually have over 2 million followers, and there were over 200 in that stream. But listen, I think we got off on the wrong foot. Honestly, I don't care. You can just leave now, because when my boyfriend arrives, he's going to kick your butt. So you better just move on. He's wealthy and belongs here, unlike you. Just then, I heard Abe approaching. I knew it was him by the scent of his cologne. He always wore too much, and it was always the same brand. Hey, bro. Looks like you already met the love of my life. Michelle, let me formally introduce you to my brother Josh. Josh, this is Michelle. Yes, we met. Maybe we should just head inside and introduce her to our folks. Although I can't see, I'm pretty observant about the world, and I could feel the shift in the mood. 
Michelle had been taken by surprise, and Abe was oblivious to the tension that she had created. The silence spoke volumes. After a few awkward seconds, we went into the house. Our parents greeted us there, and things went fairly smoothly until dinner. I went to sit in my usual spot and found that my chair had been moved. As a blind person, having things in consistent locations makes my life a great deal easier. I had thought that my mother was in the room, but it turned out to be Michelle. Hey mom, can you help me find my seat? I didn't realize that you had rearranged things for our guest. Oh, am I in your spot? I wanted to sit next to Abe. I didn't know there was assigned seating. Of course that's okay. I just need to know when things change so that I can adjust accordingly. I'll try to keep that in mind. It must be nice for you to come over, eat good food every so often. I'm actually a good cook. Well, no, I meant that. It must be nice to visit. People are well off like your parents and Abe. Being poor makes it hard to eat healthy and good food. Things were not getting any better, and I could sense that Michelle was less than impressed with me. Plus, I was very confused why she was convinced that I was poor and that Abe was wealthy. While Abe wasn't remotely poor, he barely made half of what I did with my vlog. It didn't matter though, so long as Abe was happy. Does your dog have to be in here with us? I don't want dog hair in my food. It's my seeing eye dog, so yes. I'm sorry if her presence bothers you, but I need her with me. After that, Abe and our parents joined us in the dining room, and we all sat down and ate our meals. I chose to stay silent about Michelle's behavior, as I just assumed that maybe it was her being nervous. But as the months ticked by, she continued to be very rude to me. It hurt me to continue to stay silent, but Abe was so happy, and I didn't want to do or say anything that might jeopardize his happiness. But then he announced that he had proposed to Michelle, and my heart sank. This awful person was now going to be a member of our family permanently. The day before the wedding, we all gathered at the church for the rehearsal, and Abe had asked me to be his best man, and of course I had accepted. However, Michelle had made an incredible fuss over it, so much so that I thought for certain that Abe would finally see her for the terrible person that she was. Well, yeah, it's okay if Josh is your best man, but does he have to bring his dog down the aisle with him? Couldn't we just have the maid of honor show him the way? Yes, but his dog is important. Without his dog, he has no way of navigating through the world. And if the maid of honor ever has to do something, he will be left without any guidance at all. Except I don't want that animal in any of our wedding photos. It's bad enough that he'll be wearing sunglasses the whole time. I could tell that Abe was bothered by this, and I did appreciate him sticking up for me. In the end, Michelle relented and allowed me to have my guide dog, although I didn't trust her, and sure enough the next day, I found out that I was right not to. As the ceremony began, I couldn't find my guide dog, no matter how much I called for her. However, the ceremony had to begin, and so I allowed the maid of honor to escort me. It was so jarring and worrying to stand up at the altar without my guide dog. I felt truly blind in that moment and tried to hide my panic as best as I could. Abe squeezed my hand and held it in support of me. Suddenly though, my mother came up to me and handed me the leash to my dog. Oh, thank you, mom. Where was she? Is she okay? I could tell by the tone in her voice that something was upsetting her. She did not sound happy at all. We found her locked in a closet in Michelle's changing room. But how did she get there? Oh, I think we both know how. She was right. There was no other way around it. Michelle had locked my guide dog in her changing room so that she couldn't be a part of the wedding. This was a step too far, and I wanted to say something, but I waited until just the right moment. The ceremony began, and Michelle came down the aisle to meet us at the front of the church. The priest then began to speak, and when he said that famous line, I jumped in and spoke my piece. Should anyone present know of any reason that this couple should not be joined in holy matrimony? Speak now, or forever, hold your peace. I object. This woman is an absolute monster, and a gold digger as well. Josh? What are you talking about? Oh, will you just shut up, you horrible cripple? You're ruining my wedding. No, Michelle. You ruined your own wedding by being a monster. Abe, Michelle has had issues with me since we first met. My guide dog was found in her dressing room, locked in her closet. She purposefully tried to keep her away, despite the fact that I need her with me at all times. Michelle, is this true? Well, um, I mean, 
You can't prove that it was me that put her in there. Plus, she is only marrying you because she thinks you're rich. What do you mean? He is rich, unlike you. No, I'm not. I mean, I do okay for myself, but compared to Josh and my parents, I'm not rich at all. Wait a minute. What are you saying? Are you saying that you don't have as much money as this blind idiot? No, I don't. And I can't believe I couldn't see the real you until this moment. I'm sorry, but there is no way I would marry someone like you. Enraged, Michelle turned towards me and tried to kick my guide dog but slipped on her own dress and fell down the short flight of stairs that led up to the altar. I could hear her hit the bottom of the steps hard before she screamed in frustration and then ran out of the church. I counted my blessings that she hadn't successfully kicked my guide dog and that she had made a massive fool out of herself in the process. I felt so bad that I had ruined his wedding, but Abe assured me that I had done him a massive favor. As it turned out, Michelle was drowning in debt and had seen Abe as a way to escape that debt because she thought that he was rich and would pay for her to be debt-free and to have a lavish lifestyle. Had he married her, he would have been ruined financially. It was true that he made good money, but she owed more money than he could ever afford to pay off, and the minimum payments alone would have drained his bank account within a few months. Abe was so grateful that I had rescued him, but I felt angry at knowing that had things hadn't happened the way that they did, that he would have been completely ruined, and so I chose to do something that I normally wouldn't. Thankfully, Abe and Michelle had hired a videographer for the ceremony, and they had filmed the whole interaction. I managed to get a copy of the video, and I posted it to all of my social media accounts and put her on blast. The backlash against her was intense, but more than warranted. I begged my followers to not attack her, but to also not give her a chance to hurt anyone else. That anyone getting involved with her should know what kind of person that she actually was. As a result, I heard that she ended up losing her job as they saw the video and didn't want anything to do with someone that would attack a guide dog. I'm not sure what became of her, but the last I heard of her, she moved to another city and had even changed names. Honestly, she was just lucky that her kick missed though, as I would have pressed charges against her and ensured that she went to prison. Thankfully though, there is a happy ending to this story. Abe did eventually find someone that not only was a genuinely good person, but was a perfect fit for our family. In fact, she was the woman that had trained my guide dog. They truly do make the perfect couple, and knowing how happy they make each other has even made me wonder if I should begin trying to find someone to spend my life with as well. Perhaps I will. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. I ran to him and pulled his shirt, begging him to talk to my mother, but he couldn't say a word. He stood at a spot, staring into nothing with tears streaming down his eyes. We begged my mother until she reached the gate. Get away from me, you stupid things from a useless man. She yelled and kicked us off carelessly. With the force she kicked us with, my sister got a terrible injury on her forehead that had blood gushing out of it. I ran back into the house as fast as my short legs could carry me, wailing. Hi there. My name's Alex. I am 30-year-old living in a serene part of Australia. My mother left my sister and I when I was only seven years of age. My father was a gentleman. They got married three years before I was born. They'd both planned to start having kids immediately after marriage, but failed. The doctor said my mother was having a problem with her womb and had to be on medication. My father was fine with it. For two years, my mother was on medications. My father was patient. Even though he badly wanted kids, he endured with her until the doctor confirmed her to be fine. One year later, she got pregnant with me. You can tell that my father was the happiest man on earth to hear the news from her. Two years after my birth, she took in for my sister. And three years later, she gave birth to my brother. A year after his birth, my mother began nagging terribly. Why are you just returning from work? Don't you know your children and I need you? My father always apologized. On days when he was home, he would spend all of his time with us. Still, my mother wasn't appreciative. Man Soon, he caught her cheating with a colleague of hers at the new place she began working at. Prior to that, she'd begun exhibiting even worse behaviors. I work all day. Have you no ounce of pity for me, you stupid man? On the day he caught her, they had a fight the previous night. I knew because their loud noises woke me up and I was forced to leave my room. 
What have I not done for you, Jane? I've done everything I can to be a good husband and keep this family whole. Oh, keep your sermons to yourself. What have you done that no other man hasn't? If you make me pissed, I'm going to leave you. I was scared to hear that threat. I rushed back to my room and buried my face in my small pillow, crying. The thought of my mother leaving us scared me. That fateful day, my father returned home looking utterly disorganized. His eyes also looked like mine whenever I cried so much, and that filled my small mind with worry. Are you okay, Daddy? He looked up at me with a smile and assured me that he was. In that heartbroken state he was, he prepared dinner, fed us, gave us our night bath before putting us to sleep. Two hours later, I woke up from a nightmare. I dashed out of my room and went to my parents, but no one was there. I went to the living room, only to see my dad sitting on the floor, still in his office clothes, tears rolling down his eyes. I couldn't go to him. I turned and headed back to my room. I would later come to know that after he caught them in her office, my mother had told him to his face that the man was the new person she loved, and he and his children could go kill themselves for all she cared. For two weeks, my mother didn't return home. Whenever we asked my dad, he would say she was on an important trip and would be back soon. Three weeks later, she returned home with my father's parents. I admit my mistakes. Please forgive me. I was out of my mind. I promise it will never repeat itself. My grandparents also joined in pleading for my father's forgiveness. Eventually, he did. She returned home and quit her job. For the first two months, she was a great wife. She took care of us properly, spent more than enough time with us, and also became a loving wife to my father. We had no idea what she was planning. One night, while we were all watching a movie in the living room, my mother's phone rang. The call took barely 10 seconds. After the first word and an okay, she excused herself and left the living room. When she reappeared, she was with a bag and two boxes. My father was alarmed. What are you doing, babe? Where are you going? I'm leaving you, fool. I'm going to start my life with a man who cares for me. My father was confused. He thought she'd changed. She suddenly grabbed my brother. Just so you know, Jacob isn't your son. My son, his father and I are going to start a new life of our own. That night, we cried and pleaded with her, but she was bent on leaving. We were young, so the thought of separating with our mother and brother was too much for us. My father was dumbfounded. I ran to him and pulled his shirt, begging him to talk to my mother, but he couldn't say a word. He stood at a spot, staring into nothing with tears streaming down his eyes. We begged my mother until she reached the gate. Get away from me, you stupid things from a useless man. She yelled and kicked us off carelessly. With the force she kicked us with, my sister got a terrible injury on her forehead that had blood gushing out of it. I ran back into the house as fast as my short legs could carry me, wailing. Mother kicked Abby. She's crying blood from her head. My father snapped out of his shocked state and dashed out of the house. I grabbed his car keys and ran after him. We met my sister unconscious. It took a week before she finally woke up in the hospital. She lost a lot of blood. The fall nearly affected her brain. The wound left a huge scar on her forehead that made her insecure for years. We finally returned home after spending almost four weeks at the hospital. In tears, my father calmly explained the situation to us. Even in that moment, he pleaded with us to not hate our mother, but it was unacceptable for my sister and I. We despised her from that young age. Met Ten years later, while we were spending time with our father at a park, his phone suddenly rang. He was happy to see that the caller was my mother. He quickly called for our attention and answered the call, putting it on loudspeaker. Hey loser, I'm calling to tell you that I'm leaving the life I've always dreamed of. My extremely wealthy husband takes good care of my son and I. I hope you and your children continue wallowing in poverty. I lost it there and was about to speak but she hung up. My father wasn't poor, he wasn't rich, but we were satisfied with his level. How could she be so evil to him and us, her innocent children? My hatred for her increased even more. That call brought back all the emotions he'd been locking in, and my father fell into depression. He tried his best for two years to defeat it, but his best didn't seem enough. Three years later, my father committed suicide. He left us an apology note and the password to the safe he'd been saving money for the past 20 years. Although we were devastated by the loss of our father, the wealth he left behind managed to console us. With that money, 
I made good investments and trained my sister and I throughout our education years. My mother returned, eight years after my father died, looking old and haggard. According to her story, her husband and Jacob had died in a car accident. His real wife and his family came and sent her out with nothing. She begged for our forgiveness, and I accepted. My sister was furious, but I let her know that. I have a plan. For one year, I ensured we both lived with my mother in the only mansion I had in America. We showed her all the love she could ask for and treated her better than she could ever imagine. After that year, I sold the house without her knowledge. I rounded up everything I had to do in America. One night, while all three of us were watching a movie, I got a call from my manager that my flight was ready. I signaled to my sister and we both excused ourselves. We grabbed a bag and two boxes each, the remaining properties we had there, and walked back to the living room. My mother was surprised and asked where we were going. This was the same way you left us, years ago. The owner of this house and everything in it is coming tomorrow, so you better evacuate. The cars outside have all been sold. For your bank account, my manager has taken every penny I left there. We're leaving this country, and we pray to never see you again. Just like we did that night, my mother begged, nearly crying her eyes out. When we got to the gate, I pushed her, but she was lucky enough to land safely. We walked out, and my second manager was waiting by the gate with a car. We got in, and he drove off. I turned to catch a smirk on my sister's face. With a smile, I asked her if she's happy. More than happy. I did something too. I figured your plan wouldn't be enough payback, so I planned mine. Yesterday, I injected her with HIV patient blood telling her it will make her look younger, and she believed it. Then I later posted her pictures on social media with caption, beware of this sexy HIV patient. Next day, I received a call from my neighbors informing me that the following day, the property owners arrived and my mother adamantly refused to leave. Unfortunately, the situation escalated, resulting in her being beaten. The police were subsequently called, leading to her arrest, and she's now facing a sentence for trespassing. Hope we did the right thing. Hi, my name is Claire, and my family is very toxic. For starters, my parents would constantly try to pit my siblings against each other. We were forced to compete for their love and attention. If one of us got lower grades than the other two, they would belittle them and make them feel inferior. For sports, whoever did the worst would be yelled at and usually punished by being slapped. My parents thought that this would toughen us up and that by being forced to compete with one another, that it would make us stronger and more resilient, but all it really did was make us feel unloved and untrusting of each other. However, my younger brother Josh decided one day that he would no longer play our parents' insane games, and not long after I followed suit, which made both our mother and father very upset with us. They could tell that they were losing power over us, and so they doubled their efforts, and while it stung every time that they would abuse us, both of us decided that we would stick to our guns and chose to support each other and just ignore them. We figured that we would only have to put up with them until we were 18, and then we would be on our own and would no longer have to put up with them. Our eldest sister, Vanessa, though, continued to berate us and did her best to keep trying to win our parents' love. She hadn't come to realize that they didn't love us and were only playing games with our love and attention. Once our parents realized that my brother and I would no longer compete with Vanessa for their approval, they began to focus only on Vanessa and no matter what she asked for, they would give it to her. She had the nicest of clothes and had every toy she could ever want. And when she got older, they would pay to have her in every class or play on any sports team that she wanted to join. My mom will neglect me and won't even buy me pads. My parents never yelled at Vanessa and will celebrate all her birthdays, whereas I and my Josh will get nothing. It was so incredibly unfair as Josh and I had to struggle for everything that we needed or wanted. Mom and dad, can I please have $20 so that I can join the science team after school? The money will be used to buy materials to do experiments with. It will really help me to do better in chemistry and biology. That's outrageous. We aren't made of money. If you want the money, then you should get a job. But I'm not old enough to get a job. Shut up. Girls in other countries your age are married and working. You are just lazy. Oh, daddy, I need $100. Of course, my dear. Here you are. Have lots of fun. But you didn't even ask what it was for. 
That's so unfair. How dare you talk back to me? Go to your room. You're grounded. No matter what I asked for, it would always end that way. For years, Josh and I struggled while Vanessa was given everything that she ever needed. That is until I graduated from high school. I knew that our parents wouldn't spare a single dollar for my college, and so I just applied for financial assistance and was accepted. Leaving for school was such a wonderful relief, although I felt guilty that Josh still had to endure a few more years living in our parents' home before he too could leave and go to school. After I graduated college, I began looking for work and managed to find work as a freelance writer. The pay wasn't much, but it allowed me to get my own place. And so I moved out from my parents' home and felt such relief knowing that I wouldn't have to live with them and their abuse anymore. When I was about living our house, my mom was so happy and said, Make sure to send us money, okay? Now that you going, Vanessa can use your room to keep some of her dresses. I didn't say anything and just left. A couple of years later, Josh graduated from business college and I offered for him to move in with me. Are you sure, Claire? I wouldn't want to impose. Of course. Besides, it wouldn't be permanent. It would just be until you can get yourself settled. Plus, I feel guilty for leaving you alone in that house with our terrible parents. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I do appreciate it. I just need to find myself a job like yours and start making some money. Well, I don't make that much. I would love to have the book I wrote publish it, though. Maybe that would make me rich. The two of us laughed, but then Josh got very serious. Well, why don't you try to do it actually? As a thank you for letting me stay with you, I could help find companies interested in publishing your book, and I could even find you signing gigs. I could be like your manager. What do you say? I mean, it didn't hurt, and if Josh really wanted to, I was willing to trust him and let him give it a try. And so, he got to work finding a company to make my book a reality, and after a few rejections, he found one that was interested. They gave me a huge signing bonus and offered me a contract to write five more books. I still have no idea how Josh managed to get that amazing deal but it was the start of my career as an author. Josh was also offered a job by the company as well. A couple years later, I managed to buy myself a large house and had Josh move in with me while he looked for one for himself. It was a dream come true, and the two of us were so happy. That is until Vanessa came to visit. How on earth did you two losers afford such an amazing home? Did you become criminals or something? No, Vanessa. Claire is an amazing author, and I've been managing her. We're adults now. Why are you still so mean? You do realize that mom and dad aren't even here, right? There's no one here for you to impress. Oh, them. Yeah, I don't have a use for them anymore. Listen, when can I move in? What do you mean? Well, mom and dad don't have any more money and they're being too strict, so obviously I need to move in with you two losers. As it turned out, Vanessa had tried several times to go to college and had our parents pay for classes every time. When she failed, she would then just apply and take a different course racking up massive amounts of debt as she did so. Since our parents were paying, they began to get overwhelmed with the debt and could barely afford their mortgage, let alone the growing debt that Vanessa was accumulating. Finally, they told her that she needed to start paying for things as well and that they would force her to live on a very strict budget. Vanessa, however, refused to do so and had decided that either Josh or I would just let her move in with us so that she could continue to live like she had gotten used to. Your family and you both have money, so it's your responsibility to help me. No, Vanessa, we don't need to help you. You're an adult. You need to figure this out on your own. Vanessa began to start crying and began to get angry. She couldn't understand why we wouldn't just give in like our parents always used to. And after asking her to leave a dozen times, we were forced to threaten to call the police and have her removed as a trespasser. After she left, the two of us called up our parents to see what had happened. They were incredibly desperate and begged us both to help them, or else they would have to file for bankruptcy and end up losing their house. Please, you two need to help us. Your older sister has bankrupted us and we are desperate. And why would we? You were terrible to us. You gave Vanessa everything and never cared about us until now that we've made it. Yes, exactly. The two of you are rich now. You can help us out. Are you insane? Nope, you never helped us. We had to do everything, just the two of us. And why would we? You were terrible to us. You gave Vanessa everything and never cared about us until now that we've made it. And so, we hung up on them. Part of me felt a bit guilty, but they had chosen to support only Vanessa, and they could have put a stop to enabling her bad behavior at any time and hadn't. It wasn't our fault that they didn't want to be responsible parents. After we hung up the phone, though, Josh began to grin devilishly. 
and I couldn't help but wonder why. A few weeks later, he invited me to go for a drive with him. Where are we going? I have a wonderful surprise. I finally found a house that I wanted to buy. As he spoke, we pulled up in front of our parents' house. Josh had managed to buy it once the bank repossessed it from our parents. Why did you buy it? Revenge. So many bad memories were made in this place for us, and I wanted to give the house a chance to create some good memories for me instead. But what about Vanessa and our parents? As it turned out, Josh had filed a restraining order against them so that they couldn't go anywhere near his house. As it was, Vanessa and our parents had been forced to move into a tiny bachelor pad together. Every so often, they would try to call and beg us for money, but we would just let their calls go to voicemail and never answered them. The three of them were miserable and constantly fought but had no choice but to continue to live together as they tried to climb their way out of debt. Not long after moving into his new house, Josh met a girl and ended up getting married and having three wonderful children there, filling the home with good memories. Not long after his first child was born, I too got married and I'm happy to say that I am pregnant and am expecting my daughter to be born any day. Both Josh and I would never have guessed that we would escape from our toxic family, but we're truly glad that we did and were given the chance to make a whole new family, even if we had to cut out our parents and older sister to do it. Thanks for watching. Please like and share the video. Okay, now that you are here, let's get down to business. You are not my son. You are my property, and you will do what I say and when I say it, or else there will be dire consequences. To illustrate her point, she grabbed a leather belt and slammed it hard onto a table. The snapping sound reverberated in my head and nearly made me pee in my pants from fear. I somehow just knew that if I disobeyed, that she would use that belt on me. You are still little, but you will work hard, and I will give you food and a roof over your head. Do you understand me? Yes, Mama, I do. I am not your mother. To give birth to someone as filthy and inferior as you would disgrace me. I would sooner take my own life before giving birth to someone that wasn't white. Never say that word again. If you must address me, then call me ma'am or master. Is that understood? Yes. Master, I'm sorry. Good. Now I am going to show you how to do the dishes and wash the floors. I expect you to do them every day from now on. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am. Karen then proceeded to show me how to mop and sweep the floor, as well as how to wash all the dishes by hand. It was hard putting them away since I was so short. Hi there. My name is Carl, and I know that many people have rough childhoods, but I think mine was especially harsh. I say that because, well, um, let's just say that I ended up getting revenge. You might think that I went a bit overboard, but that's something you will have to decide for yourself. Let me start off by saying that I was born to very young parents. Neither my mother nor father knew what to do with me since they were essentially just kids themselves. Since they couldn't afford to care for me, they gave me up for adoption. Of course, this happened when I was just a baby and I didn't realize what was going on, but I found this out later. More on that in a bit, though. I was in the adoption system for quite a few years, sadly. It was really lonely, but eventually, at the age of seven, I was adopted by Karen. The adoption agency was confused why a single white woman would want to adopt a black boy, but Karen convinced them that she merely wanted to give me a good home and to love me unconditionally. That, of course, was a complete lie, as I found out when I got to my new home. Okay, now that you are here, let's get down to business. You are not my son. You are my property, and you will do what I say and when I say it, or else there will be dire consequences. To illustrate her point, she grabbed a leather belt and slammed it hard onto a table. The snapping sound reverberated in my head and nearly made me pee in my pants from fear. I somehow just knew that if I disobeyed, that she would use that belt on me. You are still little, but you will work hard, and I will give you food and a roof over your head. Do you understand me? Yes, Mama, I do. I am not your mother. To give birth to someone as filthy and inferior as you would disgrace me. I would sooner take my own life before giving birth to someone that wasn't white. Never say that word again. If you must address me, then call me ma'am or master. Is that understood? Yes. Master, I'm sorry. Good. Now I am going to show you how to do the dishes and wash the floors. 
I expect you to do them every day from now on. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am. Karen then proceeded to show me how to mop and sweep the floor, as well as how to wash all the dishes by hand. It was hard putting them away since I was so short, but she showed me how to use a stepladder in order to get to the top shelves. Over the next few weeks, she also showed me how to do other chores around the house, and the older I got, the more I was expected to do. Even when I was sick, that was no excuse for me to not do my various duties. And I learned very quickly that Karen had little patience for the word no. When I was 10, I had a very bad fever and had almost no energy, but Karen wouldn't hear of it. Why aren't your chores done by now? I'm sorry, ma'am, but this fever is sapping all of my strength. I need to lie down. The hell you will. You better get to work right this second or you'll be punished. I am sorry, but I can barely keep my head up. I think I'm really sick. No sooner had the words left my mouth than the belt came out. Karen was ruthless. She struck me several times with the belt before finally stopping and threatening me with it. There, now do you want more or will you get back to work? All I could do was nod and try my best to do as I was told. Not only was I sick, but now I was also in a great deal of pain. When she finally walked away, I quickly went to the bathroom and cleaned myself up before getting back to work. Sadly, things like that continued for years. The only saving grace was that I was allowed to go to school, as it would raise far too many red flags for her if I didn't. She would have homeschooled me, but she refused to waste her time teaching me anything other than how to do chores. As I got older, Karen began to worry that I might leave once I was 18. She had managed to keep me under her thumb, but the closer I got to being an adult, the more often she would have to resort to abusing me to get me to do as she wanted. And then I heard her talking on the phone with a friend of hers. Yes, Tessa, I need someone to replace Carl. The jungle boy is getting to be too old and far too disobedient. I think I will have to adopt another boy to be my slave. I love that you call them that. It was such a good idea of yours to adopt these kids and use them as free labor like this. Well, if you get a new one, then I should probably do the same. Luckily for me, Karen always spoke on the phone via the speakerphone, so I could hear her entire conversation. I had always known that she viewed me as nothing more than just free labor, but for her to state that I was essentially just her slave irritated me so much. And now she was talking about adopting another child, so that once I grew too old, that she would still have someone that she could abuse and use as a slave. Not only that, but all her friends were doing the exact same thing too. Well, I wasn't sure what to do, but a few weeks later, Karen came home with a young boy who was seven years old. Like me, he was black too, and he was quite scared. Well, Carl, this is Thomas, and he will be assisting you. I trust that you can train him and get him up to speed on what I want done around the house. Yes, ma'am. As soon as I saw Thomas, I had a plan in mind. One day when Karen was away from the house, I told Thomas to keep working and that I would be back shortly. I went out and bought a camera and a voice recorder with some money that I had managed to squirrel away over the years. Then I went back home and got ready. I knew that it was only a matter of time before Karen did something wrong. And sure enough, the next day Thomas didn't fold her laundry the way she preferred and she hit him with her belt a dozen times. It was hard to film it and not try to stop her, but I knew that I needed the evidence. Later I apologized to Thomas for not stepping in, but he swore that he forgave me and that he understood how important it was to get it on film, as it would help us get free from that wretched woman. Later that day, Karen was bragging on the phone to Tessa about how she had already had to discipline her new slave, but that overall, that he was doing quite well. Tessa responded that her new slave was also doing well and that she couldn't be happier with things. I was recording her on phone. I couldn't help but smile broadly as I had more than enough for what I wanted to do. The next time that Karen was out of the house, I went to the library and anonymously posted the videos and recordings I had made onto various social media sites. I hoped that people would see them and take action on our behalf, but boy, was I underestimating the backlash. The very next day, Karen was assaulted while walking through the neighborhood. Somebody walking down the street ran up to her and knocked her unconscious. People even threw bricks through the windows of her car. I couldn't believe how quickly things were happening. But then Karen came home early from work. I don't know what's going on, but I was just fired from work because one of you shits posted a bunch of things online about the way I discipline you. So I am going to hit you both with my belt until the one that is responsible confesses. You can go ahead and try, but the second you raise that belt up, 
I will take it from you and I will whip you with it. I'm not some small defenseless child anymore. She called me bluff and slashed me with it twice before I wrestled it away from her and then I whipped her with it a bunch of times. She was sobbing on the ground when suddenly the front door was kicked in and several police officers rushed into the house. I instantly dropped the belt and backed away, but they weren't interested in me. They rushed at Karen and roughly put handcuffs on her and then threw her into the back of a police car. As it turned out, the public had seen the videos so much that they were demanding that the police do something to save Thomas and I. However, that was only the tip of the iceberg. The police figured out who else Karen knew that had done the same thing as her, and they had rounded them all up and arrested the lot of them. There were four people total that had adopted black children to just use them as slaves. Karen had only been the ringleader and first one to do so. A month later, Karen and the other three monsters went to trial and were sent to prison for decades for abuse, enslavement, and child endangerment. I was so relieved that Karen could no longer hurt us, but at the same time, I was afraid that Thomas and I would be put back into the adoption system. However, that was when things finally started to go my way. Since I was almost 18 at the time, I was allowed to adopt Thomas, and because we were Karen's only family, we were given her home and assets as compensation for her crimes against us. We ended up selling her massive mansion and took the money and bought a more reasonable home. My real parents even saw me on the news and came forward and apologized for abandoning me as a child. They have both done quite well for themselves, and they even agreed to adopt a few of the children from the other households that were using them as slaves. With their help, we were able to find homes for everyone that had been abused, and although it was awkward at first, I even began to develop a relationship with my parents. To this day, Karen writes to me and Thomas and begs us to help her, but neither of us ever visits her in prison or writes back. Should she live long enough to serve her full sentence in prison? She had better not come looking for Thomas and I, though. If I see her face again, I'll take my belt off and whip her with it again. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed, and we will try our best to reply to your comment. When suddenly I heard a window shatter and rushed into the living room to find George destroying furnitures having just broken into the home. Over my dead body will you inherit my father's things. He then lunged at me. I instantly pulled my gun and shot him twice. Once in the leg and once in the back. Once he was on the ground in pain, I called up the police and had them come and drag him away. Hi, my name is Emily and I have quite the story to tell you. Let me start off by saying that if you had told me that my life would be filled with so much chaos, I would not have believed you. After all, I always tried to avoid drama when I was younger, but sadly that wasn't meant to be. So my story starts off when I was in my mid-twenties. I had graduated from college and had been working for a security company for a while. I was making good money, but I had never been very lucky when it came to love. Sure, I had dated some men when I was in high school and in college, but I had never found someone that I would actually want to spend the rest of my life with. That is, until I met George. George was such a wonderful man. He was kind and patient and very, very handsome. When we first met, we instantly fell in love. Not long after we started dating, we got engaged. Many of my friends were worried that we were moving too fast, but I wasn't listening to them. I was blinded by my love for George. Emily, we really care about you, but there is something odd with George. What are you talking about? Where is all this coming from? We both just get a really bad feeling about him. There isn't anything in particular, but we just want to warn you to be careful. Their words didn't have any impact, but I would later realize that they were right to warn me. Not long after we were married, things began to change though. George started to work longer shifts and would go out many nights partying. Before this, he barely ever went out. I tried to have a conversation with him to find out what changed, but he was very dodgy. Hey George, what's gotten into you recently? You are barely home? Oh, for crying out loud. Yes, everything is okay. I just enjoy living my life. I don't understand what the problem is. Well, we just got married and I barely see you. I figured that we could start trying to have children. Children? I'm not ready for children just yet. Maybe in a year. Now stop bothering me. I'm getting ready to go out with my friends. I was incredibly annoyed, but I didn't really know what to do. I was still in love with George, but I was also incredibly confused with just how much he had changed so quickly. 
It really did appear that my friends had seen something in him that I hadn't seen, or that I had ignored. But then, one day, George came home and had his father with him. His mother had passed away before I had known him, and his father had been in declining health for many years. Emily, I need you to take care of my father. Take care of him? What do you mean? Don't question me. Just do as you're told. <laughs> George suddenly had a look in his eyes that made me feel very afraid. For the first time in my life, I felt that I was in mortal danger. I thought for sure that if I spoke out again that George was certainly going to hit me. Looking at his father, I took his arm and led him to our spare bedroom and made sure he was comfortable. Shortly after that, George left and went out to party for the night. Left alone with his father, I noticed that he was in very poor shape. I wasn't sure what was making him so ill, but it was clear that he wasn't going to get better. I went and made dinner for my father-in-law and myself and then helped him to eat. After he was done, he opened up to me. I'm sorry, Emily. I know that this isn't how you wanted to live your life. What do you mean? I know how poorly my son has been treating you, and I'm sure it is no surprise that he treats me just as poorly. Well, George hasn't always been this way, though. I don't know what happened, but he recently changed and not for the better. No, I'm sorry, but he has always been this way. He has just hidden it very well. He went on to explain how George had been terrible to him and his wife when she had been alive. Apparently, George was even known to get physically violent and had beaten both his mother and father several times over the years. He then went on to let me know that he had cancer and was dying and that he wouldn't live for much longer. This made me incredibly saddened, both because it meant that he would pass away soon, but also that George was most definitely not the man that I had thought he was. This terrified me. George's father was incredibly bitter. As it turned out, once George found out that his father was dying, he dragged the man back to his home so that he could gut and sell all of his parents' belongings and renovate their house so that once his father passed away, that they could easily sell it and make a lot of money. Well, my father-in-law despised him for that, as well as the way that he was treating me. I'm sorry to say that my son has also been cheating on you. I don't know with who, but I have heard rumors of him spending a lot of time with several different women. That can't be true. I'm very sorry, but it is. Listen, I need you to take a letter to my lawyer on my behalf. I'm too weak to deliver it myself, and the documents in it can't be emailed or read over the phone. Please do this for me. Even though it really felt like he was telling the truth, I needed to know for sure with my own eyes that what he was saying was true. So I agreed to take the letter, but only after I found out for sure if George was cheating on me. If he was, then I would divorce him instantly, as that would be the final straw. The next day, I took care of his father, but when he left to go out for the night, I followed him, and sure enough, I saw him meet with a woman, and the two kissed, and then went into her home. I pretty much knew what was going on in there, and filled with anger, I marched over to my father-in-law's lawyer and gave him the letter. The man thanked me profusely and apologized for the clandestine nature of my delivery of the letter. Trust me. All of this will end up being worth it. Just have faith. I wasn't sure exactly what he was talking about, but I also didn't care at the time. Instead, I marched home and made plans to file for divorce. The problem was that if I left George right away, then there would be no one to take care of his father. I couldn't do that to the man, and so I contacted a lawyer and told her my situation and that I needed her to prepare the divorce paperwork, but to hold off on filing it until George's father passed away. For weeks I endured George's verbal abuse and the idea that he would leave every night to spend hours in another woman's bed. It made me so incredibly angry but I knew that I wouldn't have to wait too long. Finally the day came when my father-in-law passed away. It was very bittersweet. I had grown to care about the old man and even began to love him like a second father. But I also knew that not only would his suffering end, but so would mine. After he passed, I contacted my lawyer, who sent over the divorce paperwork, which I left on the kitchen table, before grabbing everything of value from the house before leaving. Hours later, George called me up and threatened to find me and drag me back home. You evil bitch. How dare you threaten me with divorce? Do you really think that I would just let you go that easily? You awful monster. Why would you want me to stay? You've been sleeping with dozens of other women. Why would I want to be your wife after you threw our marriage vows away so easily? I'm just lucky that you never lay a hand on me. Well, now I wish I had. Maybe a black eye and a fat lip would have made you realize your place. But you know what? You're right. Now that the old man is dead, 
I'll inherit his money and home, and I'll be richer than you could possibly imagine. You've made a huge mistake. Good luck being poor. Ha! I really didn't care what he was saying. So long as he didn't challenge the divorce, I would be in the clear. Days later, though, my father-in-law's lawyer contacted me and asked to see me. When I went to his office, he announced that he had some exciting news. Hi there, Emily. I wish we could meet again under better circumstances, but I want you to know that you made your father-in-law feel very comfortable and loved in his final days. So much so that he wanted to reward you, but on the condition that you divorce his no-good son. Well, I have already done that. Yes, indeed you have. Well, you will be happy to know that your father-in-law left you his house, as well as the house that you lived in with George, along with your father-in-law's bank accounts. As it turned out, my father-in-law owned the house that we lived in. George had always been terrible with money, and his father had been forced years before to buy the house so that George wouldn't lose it. Now that he was gone, he made sure to leave all of his wealth and assets to me while leaving a substantial amount of debt to the executor of the will which was George, after he told me that I had essentially become wealthy overnight. I began to laugh and then thank the lawyer. However, I knew that once George found out that he wasn't going to inherit anything of value and instead was going to be saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt, that he would no doubt come looking for me to get even and I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of hurting me or stealing what was rightfully now mine. I filed a restraining order against him and then went and bought myself a gun. A week later, I was looking at my father-in-law's old house and was taking stock of what I needed fixed before moving in when suddenly I heard a window shatter and rushed into the living room to find George destroying furnitures having just broken into the home. Over my dead body, will you inherit my father's things? He then lunged at me. I instantly pulled my gun and shot him twice, once in the leg and once in the back. Once he was on the ground in pain, I called up the police and had them come and drag him away. They had a million questions, of course, and it took answering them all three times before they believed that I was the new owner. All of them found it incredibly funny and were pleased. They dragged him to a hospital, but once they released him, they then took him to prison. He ended up being sentenced for 10 years since they found all kinds of tools, which George meant to use to kidnap me. I'm not sure what his overall plan was, but I do know for one thing that George will be forced to use ramps going forward since one of the bullets that I shot him with lodged itself into the base of his lower back at his spinal column and did so much damage that he was told that he would never walk again. I found it rather poetic that after he had mistreated both his parents and myself, that I was able to scoop up the very wealth that he had planned to keep away from me. I wrote him a letter saying that should he still want to tell me how unfairly he had been treated, then he was welcome to pay me a visit once he was finally released. However, he should know that if I ever see him again that I plan to make sure that the next house that he breaks into, he better have a wheelchair ready. I made sure to include a picture of myself holding my gun. I wanted him to know that if he tried anything, that next time I wouldn't shoot at him randomly, but instead, that I would aim for his heart. Since then, I have enjoyed lots of quiet and peace. And who knows? Maybe I'll still be able to find my Prince Charming one day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed and we will try our best to reply to your comment.